guys, welcome back to another video. This is Motivation for Young Christians. Welcome back, welcome back. Welcome back to another Bible study. Today we have Brother Gio, Brother Jaze, and Brother Josh. We'll be diving into John chapter 15, verses 18 through 27. To begin, we're going to start off with a prayer by the Jaze, and then we're going to... Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We honor you. We thank you. Lord, thank you so much for bringing us through another week. God has... We gather here on Zoom this Saturday morning. We want to say thank you for the opportunity. God, as we're about to go study your word, we ask that you be with us. We ask for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Holy Spirit, we pray for revelation. We pray, God, that iron will continue to sharpen iron, as your word says. And so have your way and let your will be done. We pray that this session will be not only a blessing to us, but a blessing to those that will listen to it after. So we leave uh, this session in your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, guys, we'll be diving into the word for today. Verse 18 says, If the world hates me, remember that it hates me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong unto it. But you are no longer a part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I have told you? What I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they'll persecute you. And if you had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do this to you because of me. For they have rejected one who sent me. They will not be guilt if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for sin. Thank right, guys, that was verses 18 through 22. Now we we'll get everybody thoughts on the scripture. Um, I think that it really paints a plain picture. It's really easy to understand here, you know. Um, as children of God, we persecution is inevitable. I mean, I think it's in a different form than, specifically in, in America, it's in a different form than what a lot of the disciples and what Jesus went through back then but you can look at the persecution that Christians face overseas where you can't worship Jesus publicly. You can't mention the name of Jesus without your life being threatened. Uh, we look at the things that a lot of our international missionaries have to deal with. You know, they go into these foreign territories. No one can know that they're there to, you know, serve for the Lord or they put their life at risk. Um, and it really shows that, you know, we live in a world that stands for a lot of things that are not of God. Um, but it's also a beautiful thing that there's so many of us who are willing to go through those dangerous situations to, you know, win those souls for the kingdom of God. Um, but specifically within our country, I'd say, cause like, I don't feel that many of us face that type of persecution. Um, as Christians in general, I think we stand for things that are kind of counter culture at times. So when you're standing for those things or when you're, you know, standing firm in your beliefs of what the Bible says regarding our lives, um, not everyone's going to like it. Not everyone's going to like you. And even, it's even like when we're young, you know, we get called church boy and church girl and stuff like that because we don't want to necessarily dive into the things that the world does. But Jesus makes it plain here that, you know, they rejected him, the most loving man, the most compassionate man in the world who's ever walked uh, on this earth. They rejected him and they're going to reject us as well. But I just think it attests to the fact we have to continue to stand strong in the midst of that adversity and that we'll be blessed for it. So that's what I took away from that. I've got a better question for you, for those watching. So we don't live overseas, right? We live, well, relative to what you're talking about, we live in the U.S., right? With us having the freedom to serve whomever we choose to serve in the United States, why is it so difficult for us to make a choice? We don't have anybody persecuting us. Why is it so hard? Think about it, right? So, he, so, so I don't need to cut you real quick, but the disciples, the apostles, right? They serve even though their lives are on the line. Paul was locked up, still writing letters. Right? This dude was still getting to it. We didn't have any like persecuting us, trying to kill us for serving Jesus. You can walk outside Jesus, nothing will happen. But yet, we have undercover Christians, people who are afraid to say who they serve and who they believe in, depending on who they're around. They won't act as a Christian 
depending on who they're around. They'll just kind of blend in with the crowd that they're around. Why is it that we can't, with the freedom that we're given, why is it that we aren't taking advantage of it? I'll say this, because it's easier to not live um, a life, a guy. And then plus, you don't have to face all that judgment from either your family, your friends, or anybody that you got around you. As a lot of people, I would say, don't know how to handle that. You know, I had to, I had to uh, work on that in the beginning to be able to be proud to say I'm a Christian, to be able to not feel that shame that I can't do certain things with my friends and certain things with people around me. So I say the shame of like people like judging you and the fact that it's just really easy. Like it's easier to do the wrong thing. Like, and then with obviously with how this world is, it's making it more easier with, especially with the people that you got around you. Cause if you don't have the right of people around you, then it's easier to just fall into stuff like that. I said because it's easier to do wrong and like the the judgment from others. Um, I think I would add it kind of ties from I'd say maybe a lack of experience, you know, with the lives of others in other places. For example, um it's easy to brush your teeth and leave the water running forever or to be super wasteful of food and stuff until you go overseas and you see how people lack these things that we so freely give away. Right. Um, so I, I, what I mean when I say lack of experience or lack of interaction with people who are these kind of lives, right. Um, if you live in America where we're blessed to have these freedoms um, and you have no experience or you have not met someone who's had the experience of literally being persecuted as Jesus, as the disciples were in their country. Um, I think it kind of ties into what Ezra is saying about, you know, kind of just being comfortable in what you grew up in. Um, I can speak like for myself. Um, I obviously have been in church all of my life, but it wasn't until I was able to go on a mission trip, mission trip, and I was able to see what life was like for, you know, those who are in ministry in other places um, that I became more outspoken here in my own home. You know, because I'm comfortable here in America. You know, I, we can say what we want. Um, and while we don't face the, so much of the physical persecution, it's more social things. Um, but it's still something that if that's the life that you grew up in, I'd say you just feel comfortable there in a way, if that's the right word. Um, but I definitely think that we should try our best to provide people with more of these experiences or at least more education as far as, you know, what things are like for us in other places. Cause there's a lot of Christians um, specifically here in the U S that I speak to who genuinely feel like we are under heavy persecution. Um, and I'm like, maybe we are in a sense, but you, when you see what other people go through, right? Like you mentioned the name of Jesus, your head is getting chopped off. Like that's not something that we face here. Um, and it's a blessing, but I think it's something that, we should try our best to get more people aware of so that we take the liberties that we have so that we do speak out um, for Jesus more often. That's, that's all I had to add. Yeah, to me, I don't think, well, I can't say for them. Me personally, I don't face no persecution because I have the ability to talk in front of the churches and I have the ability to post these videos online without worrying about that that dress or like people trying to put like a hair or whatever type of stuff on me. So for me, I don't, I don't feel no persecution. I just, I had the freedom to um, preach the word of God in Guyana, just like I have the freedom to do it over here. I just continue to use it. Cause I've seen how, um, do like videos, how, like you said, the people in the other countries, how you, you basically getting killed just for even mentioning Jesus name. So the fact that I have that freedom, I'm going to use it to my, to my um, fullest ability. Um, I have an unprocessed thought, so you may need to edit this. I'm, I'm still trying to process it. Um, no, it, what you guys said is great, right? Josh, when I think about um, what you referenced with the other countries in, in terms of Gio's question, um, in my head, again, it's unprocessed. It's not fully processed. In order to serve Christ, Right. If if we go by what you said and what you said is fine. I'm just thinking through it. If we have to really serve Christ and commit to serving him, then we would always have to benchmark it against someone else. If that makes sense. Right. That means um, 
in order for me to fully commit, then I would have to first see someone that is committed under pressure, right? To base my commitment on Christ. So if I have to base it on someone else, am I really committed? So I'm, I'm thinking too, Gio, tell me if I'm bugging. Y'all tell me if I'm bugging, right? So Josh, if I have to base my commitment now on serving Christ based on how you serve him, um, let's say we're here in New York, right? Um, let's say I'm poor, I'm, I'm living on the street, right? And I'm serving God wholeheartedly still. I don't got nothing. Right? But you got it all together. You're in school. You live in your house. Now you see me and you're like, wow, I'm not serving God enough because here is another person that's in a dire situation, but he's serving God more than me. Um, now I need to change my commitment in the way I serve it. So, uh, so I would always be benchmarking it based on how someone else has served based on their situation. And I, I don't know if that's the right mindset to have in a sense, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I, serve God. He calls all of us. We ought to love the God, with, love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, right? Not based on, what we're going through or our persecution is not, nah, but everyone, we are to love the God, the Lord our God with all our mind, soul, strength, everything it, that's within us, right? It can't be benchmarked against what someone else is going through or their situation, right? I, I hope that makes sense. Uh, it does, it does. It does, and I've heard somebody um, said that to me before. Don't base your faith off of somebody else. Like, you have base your faith off of God. Because the thing with God and humans is we make error. We make mistakes. We may say stuff that we don't mean. We may do stuff that we don't mean. But God, what he say he means, what he do he means. He don't make mistakes. So you can't really make your faith judgment off of somebody else. You got to align that with God. Jill, you look like you're about to say something. Oh, hold on. Let me just, uh, Josh, um, what you said is not wrong. Mm -hmm. I, it was just, I just want to challenge it a little bit in how we see that. Um, because commitment is not solely based on my situation, right? Um, right. Doesn't ter determine how committed I am, right? So to answer G's question, um, it, it can't just be because they face heavier persecution or first persecution that we don't face. Um, I mean, I think about relationships. Right. Some people go through some really crazy stuff in their relationship. Right. They husband lost their job. Um, wife is sick. Um, children have, you know, terminal illness. Yet they're still committed to each other. Right. And they stick right. it through. Whereas you have people that have been married for 15, 20 years. They have everything they need. They're good. They have more than they need, more than they want. Great jobs, big house, everything. Right. They aren't committed to each other. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to just challenge that thought a little bit. Go ahead, I'm done. Gee. No, that was, that was good. I'm glad you said that because I was going to say the same thing. I was like, are we serving the Lord based off of what others, like a condition? It should just be from your heart. It shouldn't be based off the condition. And, and then I wanted to address what Ezra had to say, because he says it's easier to do wrong than it is to do right. That I want to challenge. At the top of verse 19, he says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But, I'm going to say but, 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 because you are not of the world, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. A lot of buzzwords there. It says if, it says but, it says not, it says remember. Why is it easy? Let's just talk about the Christians for now. Why is it easy for Christians to not serve wholeheartedly? Why is it easier to do wrong than to do right? I would say 
it's easier for Christians it's easier to do wrong than right. Um because you could be like on a good streak, you doing good and stuff, but then the devil what I understand the devil do with temptation, he try to he try to get at you with something that he know is easy for you to get. You know, a lot of us we have flaws, we're not perfect. So the points where he can get something that he know that's associated with you that you can easily um, fall into. And if you and a lot of us are not strong enough yet to to resist certain things, whatever um that type of thing is, um, it's different for everybody. Um and because he know that it is close to you and you don't have that strength yet, it's easier for us to um fall fall in into that. And I say from my perspective, like with my journey, why it was more easier to do wrong and do right, uh, have to do with my stubbornness and my ability to not listen. Um, when 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 temptation comes to me, that voice in my head telling me, "Don't do it, don't do something else," because I'm I already have that stubbornness in me, and I don't. And I got a listening problem. I choose not to listen and I go do whatever, whatever that wrong decision is, whatever that temptation is. So I say for me personally, it's because of my stubbornness and my ability to not listen, which I'm working on right now, so I don't fall into it. So I, I can speak from my perspective on that one. Um, I can say for me, I think it kind of ties into the fact that I think sin, like from sin temptation whatever the enemy tries to send away it's always made to be enticing right it's always made to be like you know you really you want to do this this is something that you'll enjoy this is something that'll positively benefit you um so i think about myself like when i was a little bit younger and i was first coming into my relationship with the lord um it was a major shift for me because i was like there's a lot of things that i'm going to have to cut out of my life and you know i was comfortable in a sense, in the way I was living, in the way I was talking, the things I was doing. Um, but when you come into a relationship with the Lord, I don't know if we read it already, um, but the Bible says, you know, the old man is gone and the new man comes on, right? Um, but I think in general, why it's easy, I, I don't know how I would answer that saying why it's easier for Christians to fall into the things of the world, but I think people in general, because sin is always made to be enticing. And, you know, the enemy always likes to show you, you know, what the temporary pleasure, what the temporary benefit is of what you're doing, but never, you know, the long-term detriments of what you'll face long-term. Um, so I, I don't know if that somewhat answered the question, but that's kind of my take on it. I don't want to mess with you at this point, but I'm going to mess with you. Say, let's, let's say we took the devil off the table. What would your answer be then? Thank you, Jay. So, Thank you. Because I'm looking for the scripture, bro. I'm looking for it right now. So if you take the people uh, from around you. Uh, Not the people around you. Just take the devil out of your hands. Take the devil. Then I'll say the people around you. Because if you don't have the... So I'll say the people around you. Because whether you Christian or not, you, if you don't have the right people around you, you're gonna end up falling into it. So because what I learned is that if you if you so if you're in a group of five people and you're the sixth person, if they all smart, you're gonna be the sixth smart person. If they all bad, you're gonna be the, the sixth bad person. Whoever you hang with, whoever you have around you, they're gonna revolve to you. And if you don't align yourself with the right people, align yourself with the word, you're gonna keep on falling into stuff. I feel like y'all gonna ask some follow up questions. So go ahead. I feel like that I feel like that makes sense. But I think the reason for the question was to kind of make us look inward as instead of like external wow, things. So I'm thinking like Bible says it makes it clear, our flesh lust to sin, right? Um so I, I don't know, I feel like that kind of ties into it, you know. But <laughs> you really got my brain spinning here. So Yeah, they got me over here thinking hard on a Saturday morning. They said, but, take the devil out of it. Take the adversary out of it. Okay. All right. Then I'll definitely agree. It has to do with the in, the inner side, the, the inside. And like what Jai said, like our flesh, our flesh is known for sin. Sin is all, 
all on us. And if you don't, if you don't have build the resistance with the help of God. But no, I definitely do think. I I think it is a good question. I'm looking forward to hear what you guys have to say about it because I do. I realize as Christians a lot. Like anytime there's a negative situation, (laughs) we blame it on the devil, right? Um, And we all we do a lot of self inflicted harm to ourselves that we can't necessarily realize. So while I don't have an answer to the question, um, I'm looking forward to hear what you guys have to say. I'm ready to hear what yeah, the, the devil could be minding his business. <laughs> the devil could be minding his business, and y'all just out here blaming him like that. Just, just <laughs> we're playing the blame game. Jay, you want to go before I go? Nah, nah, drop the scripture. I just want y'all to know. Right, Gio and I didn't call each other All last right. night and be like, yo, we're going to get them with these questions. I, I guess the Holy Spirit is just pushing nope. in the same direction um, to just go a little bit deeper, right? Look, beneath the surface a little bit. So full transparency, right? Because we're expecting and hoping that iron sharp as iron. I'll call Jay when I'm struggling with something. Right? Right? And likewise, he'll call me. I notice we, we have to realize that we're struggling with that thing because it's on the inside of us. For example, you said stubbornness. That's what's on the inside of you. And so, just like you said, um, Josh, look inward. So, listen to this scripture. James chapter 1, verse 14. I'll go back a scripture, a verse, verse 13. It says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither temptation, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Blessed, I'm going to go back to 12 now. It says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Stop blaming the devil for everything. The, the, the key scripture there is um, 14. It says, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. So, you hit a you hit a valid point as wrong when you talk about it's challenging as Christians and like Josh, just as people in general trying to take up this walk of faith. It's challenging because from day one, this we can blame the devil for, right? From day one, the seed of sin was put in man. And it was just passed on, right? Just passed on all the way down to where we are right now. And so we're constantly challenged and, and, and we're battling back and forth with sin and righteousness, right? So sometimes we have to do our own soul searching and see what's on the inside of us. And I think, I think that's where I was trying to get you guys to look, right? We don't have anybody trying to chop our head off when we say Jesus. But sometimes we just like we just choose to be ashamed of Jesus. And whether we believe that or not, it's the truth. It's like, all right, when you're in school, do your friends know that you serve the Lord? Do that your friends know that you go to church on Sunday? Do your friend do you invite your friends to come with you to church or, or youth service for that matter? Like, let it be known who you serve. Because it's not about you when you tell them that. It's about God. It's about souls. So you never know what seed you may plant when you say, I love the Lord. Because of your relationship with that person. And now I want to start hanging out with you and getting to know more about Christ as you invite them to things and show and share things with them. This is bigger than us. 
the only reason why these people are going to hate, like he says in the scripture, are going to hate them is because they're going out sharing the word, which is contrary to, like what you said, Josh, their culture. Nobody going to hate us if nobody knows that we love Jesus. That's the reason why. Because they are declaring and decreeing who their faith, hope, and trust is in. So dig a little deeper. Let's not always blame the devil. Sometimes it's just flat out, it's just us. We got to clean ourselves up and not out of our own strength. But the word of God is the cleansing agent. We have to read it more every day, every day, every day. That's it. Yeah, great. Um, you guys, you got great answers, guys. I don't know what you think your answers are wrong. It's just it's trying to get you to <clears throat> look outside of just the devil and outside of other people around you. Um, when Geo asks, you know, why is it so hard for Christians to be committed wholeheartedly? Um, commitment, when you think about the definition, indirectly, um, it's not stated. Um, but when you commit to someone, um, there's, there's a unspoken part of the definition that says, um, when you think about the model of communication, right, that there are other choices, right? However, you're, you're committed to one thing or one person, even though there are other choices, right? So... If I'm committing to Christ, um, there's another choice, but I'm going to commit to him and I'm going to stay committed. Right? I'm dedicated, I'm sold out, whatever it is, however you want to define it. Right? But I, I'm, I'm committed to him. Um, you spoke about temptation a little bit. Um, in that commitment or through that relationship, Christ says no temptation has over, overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide you um, a way out so that you can endure, um, right? So, so he provides a way, right? I'm, I'm trying to, I'm losing my, my chain of thought with it, but what I'm really trying to get you y'all to think of, um, yeah, it's not always the devil, it's not always people. Um, sometimes it's our, it's us, right? And are we truly committed, right? Because if we're truly committed, then... That means we let go of the other people and then we let go of the things of this world, right? So I'm just trying to get you to think of being committed on a, in a broader sense, a little bit deeper. Um, being committed, um, saying that there are some other options and choices and I see them, but I'm sticking with um, Christ or I'm sticking with this person. I'm sticking with this thing. I hope that makes sense, right? Um, when when y'all get y'all girlfriend, right? Y'all dating. There are other choices. You see them. You see them around. But you're sticking with the girl that you chose. All right? Does that make sense? Um, All right, guys, we'll, get, we'll be getting back right into the scripture. We're going to be reading from verses 23 all the way to verses 27. Verses 3 says, Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could see, they would not be guilty. But as it... They have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. The fruit fills what is written in their scripture. They hate me without cause. But I will send the but I will send you the advocate, uh, the spirit of truth. Uh, he will come to you from the father, and he will test and will testify about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. What do you just read, Ezra? A lot. I was like, uh, I read that Jesus was talking about how you were able to see everything that I did. You were able to see the Father go through me, but yet you still deny me. It's like, now these days, we can't physically see everything that God, that Jesus did, or that Jesus is doing, but they, got blessed with the opportunity to like see everything that Jesus did and Jesus confusing why like why are you not believing me? Why are you still hate me? Why are you still hating my father when you have seen all I've done? 
So look, look at verse 22. It says, they would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for their sin. What do you think he meant by that? Like, did they not know about sin before? Did they, like... Um, maybe, I feel like it's kind of saying, maybe before Jesus had come to them, they didn't know what the standard was. You know, they didn't... How do I say that? Like, you won't know that... I'm trying to say... How, we won't know if we're outside of the will of God if we don't know what the will of God concerning our lives is in the first place, right? So I think that's kind of what it's saying. It's like, you know, now you know, now you're aware, you know what is right, you know what is wrong, you know what the plan is that I have set forth for your life, and you don't have an excuse um, as to why you're, you know, intentionally living outside of that when you've seen better and you know to do better. I hope that kind of answered the question. I agree with it. I was going to compare it to like yeah. when you then know something and then somebody teach you that this is wrong and then you continue to like do it. It's like you, the the standard and what is right, what is wrong with the approach to you. So whatever you do after that, that's on you. That's, that's your fault because I was able to introduce you to it. So what Jesus is talking about is pretty much what you guys are saying, right? He, they had no real understanding of the will of God. The only way they knew about sin was through the law, right? The Mosaic law. Um, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. But that was just almost like a mirror for them to see what they were doing, to see themselves, to see their heart's condition. But to be free from that, condition that their heart is in it could only be done through christ so they didn't realize that they were guilty of anything until they actually saw the manifestation of righteousness right before their eyes which is jesus and so he's like all right you guys are living off the, Mo the mosaic law you took the 10 commandments that i gave you and you created 600 plus other laws and, and you still, you're still missing the mark. You're still missing the point that I'm trying to prove to you. And so now I'm going to come down in human form and I'm going to explain to you exactly what I mean. Now you have no excuse for your sin, but yet you still reject me. And then he goes on to 23, he says, anyone who hates me also hates my father. We can't make it into heaven to see the father without going through Jesus. So, Jesus is the gate, but he can't get into heaven without believing in him. So, he's, he's, come, he's coming down to do us a favor, to let us know how we're living and how we need to change from that lifestyle. But these people are choosing to hate him, which also means they hate the Father who sent him. They're in a bad predicament, very bad predicament. This, this type of lifestyle, like blatant rejection of God, of his spirit, is um as we learned the other day jay is a sin that's unforgivable all sins are forgivable except blasphemy against that tripped up on the advocate the advocate is the holy spirit that jesus is going to send now that he's not on earth walking with us he's going to send the advocate which is the spirit of truth to continue to teach us the truth, how we ought to really live. And it's going to teach us the will of God, as you said, Josh. So the moment you said yes to Jesus, that was the Holy Spirit working in you. And he's going to continue to develop you as long as you continue to surrender. And you will hear his voice a whole lot more, a lot like you hear it louder and clearer the more you become obedient. I know, but I, I I really want you guys to understand what's happening here. That, that I, I'll get to it. I just, you know, I, I didn't even want to get past the whole temptation thing because Javade said something really important about God providing a way out. Hands down, every time we're tempted of our own stuff, he, he provides a way out. And it all goes back to your obedience. Will you take him up on his offer to save you? Not just for temptation, but in totality. That's why he came here for, to save us. Because if not, then we're just destined 
for the complete opposite of what he's offering us. I, I fully agree with, with what y'all said. In any type of temptation, God do uh, send you a way out. Any time I've experienced temptation, or I feel like I'm about to feel uh, feel temptation, God always uh, send me with, okay, do this, do that. All right, don't go over there. Don't go over that. Don't go into that room. Don't even touch your phone. Go, go do something else. But it's up to us to listen and be obedient and be committed um, to God. I'm, I'm working on that because usually I don't listen. Yeah. I, I got to work on my listening and my obedience. Today's takeaway, Today's takeaway is uh, choices. Choices. Every day you got to choose. You're going to choose Christ or you're going to choose the world. You're going to choose obedience or you're going to choose disobedience. Choices. Because God made a choice. In verse 19, he says, I have chosen you. That was God's choice. So we're going to choose him back. I yeah, definitely like what you guys said. Um, actually, I read a devotion about That's that, about done. God giving us a way out. Um, I think it's definitely really powerful. And that's why my prayer has kind of changed. It's not, you know, Lord, show me the way out because he gives us it every time, but give me the strength to use it and give me the wisdom to actually utilize it, right? Because it's there, you know, it's there every time. We have that thought in our head, the Holy Spirit's there, you know, saying, don't do this, don't say this, don't whatever, don't act on this. Um, But when we have, it takes a lot to overcome our flesh at that point. and that's why I'm just praying daily, you know, Lord, strengthen me and please, I'm, I'm re- honestly playing, praying for wisdom, you know, just the wisdom to kind of use that escape that he gives us to pray and just to <clears throat> do what it is that we need to do. But I definitely like what you guys said about a way out. And I really do love the first question I was asked. I am actually going to kind of reflect on that some more because I think growing up in church in general, and not that every church is like this, right? But, you know, we blame, we really do blame everything on the enemy. Um, and it's not many times where I've heard stuff like this, where it's like, you know, hold yourself accountable. It is, so, and like, don't get me wrong, hate the devil, right? Hate the, hate the devil, hate that which he does. But you, we do have to have that sense of personal accountability, you know, to hold ourselves accountable. So that's definitely something I'm, I'm going to reflect on. I think that was a really good point, um, but I don't have anything else to add. My biggest takeaway for today is, like what Josh said, hold yourself accountable. Anything that happens, just know it's on you. Yeah, the devil going to tempt you. Yeah, uh, you have your personal stuff inside, but you have the power to either let the personal stuff inside overtake you. You have the power to not listen to what the devil um, tell you. And you you have the ability thing and like what um Josh said I'm gonna pray for God to give me the strength give me the wisdom to be able to do it so I got from today's accountability wise choices and commitment accountability wise choices and commitment are the three main factors that to me that's gonna help you um on this road with Christ because you gotta make sure you keep yourself accountable for every single thing you do um your choices are gonna impact the way, whether you go to heaven uh, or not, and then your wisdom is going to continue to help you to grow and build, and you're going to be able to use that wisdom to be able to help other people. So uh, commitment, choices, wisdom. Uh, That's good, yo. Um, I I enjoyed our dialogue back and forth as we uh, digged a little bit uh, beneath the surface um, as it pertains to commitment. So I wasn't just asking the, those questions to you guys and not bearing the same question on myself, right? Um, am I committed, right? You know, so um, this, this is a question of introspection, right? Am I committed? Am I benchmarking my commitment based on someone else or based on my situation? Um, so just that was my takeaway. Um, God chose us. He chose me. Do I choose him, right? Or do I only choose him when it's easy? But do I choose him also when it's difficult and tough, right? So so that's my reflective question that I'll take after the study and continue to contemplate on. So good session today.
this session. Thank you guys so much for coming out. I'm going to do my closing prayers, and we're going to do the outro. If you can, everybody bow your heads and close your eyes. Almighty God, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you, God. We thank you for this day that you've made. I rejoice be God. And be God, God. I pray this today as we came together as brothers to be able to sharpen iron, iron sharpen iron from the oldest to the youngest. We continue to educate each other. We continue to love each other. We continue to ask each other the necessary and important questions to continue to walk on this road with you, God. We pray that we'll continue to be committed to you each and every single day, God. We pray that we make the wise choices with your help, God. We pray that we continue continue to keep ourselves accountable for each and every single thing we do, God. We pray that you'll be able to give us the wisdom, the, the knowledge, and the power to continue to help ourselves and help each other out on a day-to-day -day basis, God. We just pray that you continue to, to be with us, God. We pray that each and every time we come together to do Bible study, I am with Sharpen Iron with your help, God. We pray that no weapon form against us shall prosper, God. In Jesus' name, your holy name, God. Amen. This is the end of the video, guys. Thank you guys so much for coming back. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel, turn on your post notifications. That way, anytime I upload, YouTube will send you a notification. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button. This is the end of the video. This is Motivation for Young Christian. Peace.